Pastor, it's a joy to be here for my very first time and was wondering if that was even going to happen. I'm telling you, I was on every small one lane, half lane, part of a lane road there is between here and wherever I'm staying. I didn't know if I was going to make it. And so I asked the pastor, I said, what about 150? Is it a better road? He said, it's a lot of red lights and all that. And I said, well, I wouldn't have made it if I was on 150. But I was out in the country. That's, my, that's where I, I don't know if I learned to drive yet still, but that's where I, what I do. That's what I, where I got it at. I, going around curves and up and over mountains and so forth. And so I made it. I don't know how I made it, but I did. Thank the Lord for a GPS, amen. That's right. I had Actually, I had two of them going at one time. You talking about confusion being of the devil. And, and my, my phone, when I got two GPS sources going, both of them have women voices. And they don't always agree. Can I get a witness right there? In fact, very seldom they agree. And they're both running in the background at the same time. So they're both, one is saying turn left, one saying turn right, one saying recalculate, relocate. Who, where are you going? Do you even know? And all that. So, so anyway, that's the way. It, but I made it. What about that? That's a wonder, isn't it? It's a wonder. But nobody's going to go into heaven and say, well, what about that? I made it. Ain't nobody going to say that. How did this happen? How did I get here? There won't be none of that. You better make sure you know that you know that you know on this side before you draw your last breath, before Jesus comes, or before the Holy Spirit quits dealing with you. Amen. You better know and you will know. That's right. That's exactly right. Now, there'll be some people in hell that'll be surprised. There'll be some people that wound up in the flames of hell that was putting their faith in a church membership, a good moral record, you know, their character or who they were kin to or, or, or some altar trip to the church, you know, and they never met Jesus. They met the pastor. They met, they met church people, but they never met Jesus. And they, they think they're going to they're gonna wind up in heaven and, uh, and they're in for a rude awakening. Because the truth is, a salvation that don't change your life has not changed your destiny. And I know you don't have the, what I'm about to say down here. They're all in Tennessee, but... Uh, there's people by the thousands that claim to be saved and there's no visible evidence of it. They have nothing to do with God, His work, His will, His people, uh, have nothing to do, they don't, nothing. And, and the Lord gave me a little quote a few weeks ago and I've said it numerous times. God has saved no one and left their life alone. That was worth coming to church for. Let's all stand. We'll be dismissed. Amen. I'm telling you, God has never saved anybody and then left your life alone. In fact, when he saves you, your life is no longer your life. Your life becomes his life. He becomes your Lord and your master and your leader and your corrector. Amen. And uh, you said, I don't know if I want that. Oh, I needed that. Yes, sir. Every, when I was in the driver's seat of my own life, just making, uh, I was constantly in, on the dead end roads. I was constantly in the ditch. I was constantly wrecking. I was constantly. I needed somebody that knew what they were doing to, that really did love me and wanted to choose the best for me to get in the driver's seat. And it's been 43 years Saturday, this past Saturday, two days ago, 43 wonderful, glorious years of being born again. And I highly recommend Jesus to you. Amen. 
God will always choose the best for those who leave the choice with Him. Amen. 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 If you'll let Him drive, He'll get you where you need to go. Right. Amen. Don't argue with Him. Don't get in a big tug of war match with the Lord. Right. Just know that He knows best and you don't know nothing. And let him drive. Trust him. He knows what, what we need. My, my. If we've ever been in a day that the church needs revival, it's in this hour. I'm not talking about revival meetings necessarily. I'm talking about a real move. A real move of God. Uh, the Lord in his grace allowed us to see uh, uh, three uh, moves of God last year. And uh, seemingly the devil uh, put a bullseye on me and, a, and its crosshairs on me and made a target on me. Uh, it was in January, uh, Brother Rudy Smith, Mount Sinai, I don't know how many of you know uh, Pastor Rudy Smith, Mount Sinai Baptist Church up in Pickens. And that meeting started in January and it ended up going five weeks. And I don't know, I never, outside the revival I got saved in that went seven weeks, I'd never seen anything like it. But God showed me I can do it again. And I want to tell you that here, my first time here, I want to tell you that if there's ever a day that God needs a revived church, it's now. And nothing, nothing economic or political or moral or immoral is an excuse for the church today to be dead and dry and declining and disinterested. Amen. God, is, amen. We are appointed for this last day journey. We're, amen. We're appointed, so why not be anointed? Why not be anointed? Why not have the power of God? Why not be a church alive is worth the drive? Why not be a church that is not just functioning but is under the unction of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord's allowing us to preach numerous meetings and, and I don't know why he does that but he does and, and I'm telling you a lot of churches are drying up and, and here's what's bad. They think it's excusable. They think that because of the condition of our country and of our world and of our political system Amen. Right. That, that we're excused. Well, well, preacher, this is the last days. These are the last days and surely the Lord understands. That's why we, we come to church with a long face and we, we don't have nothing positive to say. We never smile and we're in fact trying to endure to the end. Right. Well, why not enjoy to the end? I've been saved 43 years. Some of you maybe have been saved longer than that. Anybody been saved longer than that? How long? 50 years. It's not something to be endured. It's enjoyable, isn't it? It's still a great journey. I wouldn't trade nothing for it. I'm glad I'm saved. Often, often I say these words, Lord, I'm sure glad I'm not what I used to be. And I have no interest in going in that direction when the best is yet to come. Thank God we're on the, we're on the very brink of something big. Amen. I know it's dark. I know it's difficult days. I know that. But I want you to know that God still needs fire, fired up preachers, fundamental preachers. Amen. King James Bible preaching preachers. Amen. You still, you didn't have to say nothing like that, but our day you do. Right. Amen. 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 Needs, God still needs a, a church that's got it right, got their music right, and got their doctrine right, and got their preaching right, and got their standards right. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. And I appreciate your pastor leading you in that way, and not only him leading you in that way, I'm thankful that you're following you share his heart on that. Yes. Amen. Amen. I praise God for that. Yes. Well, I want to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew in the service tonight. The gospel of Matthew, and uh, I'll tell you the chapter here in just a moment. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you. 
because it's a pretty lengthy chapter. Chapter 11. I want you to turn to chapter number 11. The Lord spoke to my heart about this text and, and uh, I couldn't get away from it and I just know that this is what the Lord uh, would want us to share with you tonight. But before we read the verse, there's verses, before I share what I, my topic is and, and, and our direction tonight, I would, like to, I would like to say this about what I'm going to preach tonight. I don't know of a more influential subject. Now think about that. I don't know of a more influential subject than what I'm going to deal with tonight. I, in other words, I don't know of anything that will influence your life in every category of your life than what I'm going to preach on tonight. You said, preacher, I need to hear that. I don't know if I can handle it, but I want to hear it. It's not what you think, but I mean, it is so influential. Well, think about it. If it carries that much weight and it carries that much influence, that if it's true, it's true in your life, every area of your life is influenced by it. Every. It affects your prayer life. It'll affect your worship. It'll affect your witnessing. It'll affect you living right. It'll infect, affect, not infect. It will affect, amen, your endurance, your enjoyment. Every aspect of the Christian journey is, is inseparably connected with the subject matter that we want to deal with tonight. And I've only been here a few minutes tonight. I've never been in this church. And to my knowledge, I've never met the pastor. I don't know. I don't know. I looked around. I thought, surely I'd see somebody that I know. And I don't know if I know anybody. Do I, I, and I don't know if anybody knows me. Praise God. Hey, we're going to have revival. Amen. Amen. But you know what I'm what I was if, if that's so, if that if the subject matter tonight is so big and so influential in your whole Christian life, you'll never outgrow it. I don't care how young you got saved or how old it is before you leave this world, you'll never outlive the importance of it. So I'm not preaching something that's tied to an age group. I'm not preaching something that's just a preacher thing or a deacon thing or a few other members of the church thing. I'm talking about every believer, every person saved in this congregation. And I assume you're live stream, so every person that's watching, every person that will watch, the subject matter tonight, it will influence you positively Listen, I said that right. It will influence you positively in your life. It will never influence you negatively. It will influence you positively all of your life. All of your life. Everybody in here ought to be saying, yep, sounds like something I need, preacher. Preach it. Are you ever going to preach it? Are you ever going to get it? Well, with that in mind, let's look at chapter number 11. And I want to read three verses, but I'm not, I'm not preaching on those three verses. I just want to focus our attention on one word. One word. Look at Hebrew, excuse me, Hebrews. Matthew, I, I told you them curves, they got me. Just look over it, all right? If I have Jonah swallowing the whale, don't worry about it tonight, all right? Some of y'all didn't even catch that. Y'all must have drove the same path I did. Matthew 11, verse 28, 29, and 30. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Now the people he was addressing in this text was very interested in what he was saying. They needed what he was saying. Isn't that amazing? I believe that would help us tonight if we would realize we need what's in that Bible. We need what Jesus would say to us. Amen. And so there are, in these verses, there are three words. Of, I'm just going to deal with one of them. There are three words of responsibility that are given in this text. The first word is the word come in verse 28. The second word is the word take in verse 29. And also in verse 29, the word learn. Come, take, and learn of me. All three of those words are in the imperative mood. That is, you do it. That just simplify, that's just real simple. I could have made it a little bit bigger, but that's just as simple as I can put it. When God says, you do it, you come, you take, and you learn. And you know what I believe the reason why we're in the shape we're in, in churches just like I'm sitting in and just like I pastor, amen, that we've got a lot of areas right, amen. But I want to tell you, we need revival. And I'll tell you why we need revival. We're dropping the ball in the area of responsibilities. Things that God's word tells us to do that we're weighing it out. Well, I don't know if I'm going to do all of that. I'll do some of that if it's convenient, if it's pleasurable, if it's okay, if it doesn't cost me nothing, if I don't have to change to do it. Amen. Well, let me ask you, who gave you the right to weigh out to everything God says for you to do? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Well, the first one I want to look at and the only one I plan to look on at tonight or even this week is the very first one given. I want you to look at it tonight. The Bible said in verse number 28, come unto me. What words, what words. And so the more I thought about those words, coming from the lips of the Savior, addressing people that really didn't have nothing to offer, he said, come unto me. You know what he was doing? He was calling them to come close. And that's what I want to preach on tonight. Come, the call to closeness. You say, preacher, you talked about earlier that there's a subject that you're going to deal with tonight that influences our every aspect of our life uh, for our whole life. What is it, preacher? Closeness to Christ. Amen. Amen. We ought to look at this revival effort, amen, with that in mind, that God is calling us closer and closer and closer to him. Amen. Now, if you don't need to get closer, you're, let me just tell you, I don't believe a word of that because we're all in the same world and we're all in the same body. We're all fighting the same devil, amen. I promise you everybody in this building can be closer than we are. Could I ask you tonight, has there ever been a time in your life, be honest now, you don't, I don't want you to say anything, just think and be honest inwardly. Has there been a time you've been closer to the Lord Jesus Christ than you are tonight? The answer, for that, the answer to that for most people in this building would, would say, yes, preacher, there, is been, there has been times that I've been closer to the Lord than I am tonight. Well, I want to ask you, are you okay with that? I'm telling you, the Lord spoke to me coming down the road think, to just ask that. Are you okay with that? that you can look behind you and see a higher plateau spiritually than what you're on tonight and you're okay with that. 
that higher plateau, that higher, that higher level behind you, whenever it was, where you were closer to the Lord and more intimate with the Lord than you are tonight. That level ought to be calling for you to come back. Come, come, the call to closeness. Jesus is never content with your distance. Never. And you know what? I've learned being saved 43 years. I am never content when I am not close. Can I get a witness here? Oh, I'm glad it's that way. Oh, I'm glad it's that way. I'm glad when you get away from God, you get distant in your heart with the Lord that you're miserable. Well, I'm glad it's that way. You know why? If it wasn't miserable, you'd keep going in that direction. And I'd be preaching to empty pews tonight and somebody else will be preaching tonight. But thank God for the misery that comes in uh, to your life and the, and the peace that the peace of God, not the peace with God, but the peace of God that leaves when you get out of fellowship with God. Amen. Amen. We've got a lady in our church. She's only been saved about a year. We was having Monday night prayer meetings. We're doing a, we're doing a week of prayer this week. Uh, started last night at midnight, every 30 minutes, round the clock this whole week, every 30 minutes, somebody's praying. Now, buddy, you talking about sacrifice, brother, that's a sacrifice, especially for those at work and having to get up two, three, or four hours early to get their 30 minute slot of prayer in. Right. Are you listening? Yes, well, this, this, we were having Monday, Monday night prayer meetings uh, this time. We were just meeting to pray. Whoever wanted to come, we'd meet and pray. And we were standing there, we're getting ready to pray. We just only had a few lights in the church on. And, you know, we, that's what we was there for us, just to pray, amen. And so uh, all of a sudden, we seen lights on the windows. And so we knew somebody was coming in the lower parking lot at the church. And so Brother Ivan went down the steps to see who it was, because you never know in our day what hoodlums is trying to come in and kill everybody. Amen. And so Brother Ivan went down, th- down the steps and I-, I just stayed upstairs, you know. Well, then all of a sudden, here come Brother Ivan up the steps and two strange ladies with him are following him. And, and uh, the first words out of the first one's mouth when she come up the steps there at the organ and, and I met her and I was as close probably me to your pastor and the first words out of her mouth was, I'm demon possessed. How would you like that? (laughs) She said, I'm demon possessed and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of my life. I'm sick of the drugs. I'm sick of it and I want help. But I'm demon possessed. And I said, you might be, but you're gonna be over there. No, I didn't. I stood right there. The Lord give me grace. The Lord give me wisdom. Amen, and to discern, to talk to her, amen. Make a long story short, Miss Anne Marie come to know Jesus, not that night. I could have got a profession out of her that night, no doubt about it, but that's all it would have been. Are you listening? She didn't come from a background being in church and knew all the Bible and stuff. And so, so we dealt with her and, and she just kept coming. She started coming to church and I mean hearing the preaching and she, amen, she'd go to the altar. She didn't even know, amen. And one Sunday morning she went to the altar and God turned the light on. Miss June uh, led her to Christ and she has been changed forever. I'm telling you, changed. Good night, have mercy. Oh, you talking about a 2 Corinthians five seventeen person. Amen. Man, I mean, praise God. Well, you know what she started? She started an addiction. She just called it something more. She said, I, I, Preacher, would it be all right if I just start an outreach called something more? I said, explain that name. I knew it, but I wanted to hear it. Something more. She said, well, Preacher, you know how I was, and, and I was a drug addict, and, and just my life was nothing but a wreck, a train wreck of sin. 
And now I'm saved. Amen. Are y'all listening? And she said, now I'm saved. And I, I found out mm, there's something more. There's got to be something more to life. And I found out it wasn't really a something more, but rather it was a someone more. And she got saved. Well, some of us yesterday, uh, we only had one service yesterday because we was wading through the snow and below, below zero temperatures and stuff. So we, we, we just had a midday service yesterday. Well, there was some of us went to eat at the Mexican place and she was one of them that, that tagged along. And she was telling me, I'm going somewhere with this, she was telling us at the table there how that she had, had some, uh, some of her old friends was trying to get her to, uh, to, to go back in that lifestyle. And she didn't ever, she never done it. And, 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 the, and, the, and the Lord was dealing with her recently. It's been like three days now. The Lord's dealing with her about smoking. I was going to, but the Lord said, just let me deal with it. I said, all right, Lord, you deal with it. You know how we are sometimes. We'll move. All right, Lord, no, I got this. I will got this. Lord, deal with it better than we can. And he dealt with her. In fact, they're meeting tomorrow night. They're having their something more project meeting tomorrow night, amen? And, and, and she, she mentioned this statement. She said, preacher, she said, I lost my peace. When all of that commotion was going on after salvation uh, with some of her old friends coming back around and stuff, she never done nothing that they were doing, but she said, preacher, I lost my peace because I done told her about Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule. The, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That word rule means referee. If you step out of bounds, the peace of God will blow the whistle on you. Amen. And she didn't know how to determine except, uh, preacher, I lost my peace. And she said this, I don't ever want to do that again. I don't ever want to lose my peace again. Amen. We need to treasure the peace of God. Amen. Oh, Yes. The closeness to Christ, being close, come, the call to closeness, amen. Let me just skip through here and deal with some things. In the New Testament, when Jesus' earthly ministry, you find there was closeness to Christ that came about by two different ways. One way was that people came close to Jesus. The second way was when Jesus came close to people, amen. Amen. And there's examples of both of those in the Bible. Jesus coming close to people is a good illustration of John 4, of the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Jesus got in his path and her path, amen. But then on the other hand, you have the four men that picked up the, the, the palsied man and took him to Jesus. Either way it works. If Jesus moves to the person or the person moves to Jesus, closeness is always the condition for Jesus to work. Amen. Amen. Listen, here's a good statement right here. God in the Bible does very little from a distance. When, it, when he had to redeem man, when, he, when Adam and Eve messed up and, and God was going to have to redeem man, he could not do that from heaven. Oh, yes. He had to come down here. He had to become the son of man. He had to become one of us to be able to redeem us. He had to become a kinsman redeemer. We ought to say, whoo, glory right there. Amen, that Jesus, amen, God manifest in the flesh came from heaven to earth for the purpose of being close to us and become one of us so that he could save us. What about that? What about that? All that on us. When we could not get to him, when we could not get to him, amen, we couldn't jump, fly, climb. We had no way of getting to him. But when I, oh, Brother Squire Parsons had it right. He said, but when we could not come to him, he came to me. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad? Oh, my. 
And there's examples of both of those, that, of those times when Jesus came close to people. He got in a ship and went across the, the stormy sea. What For what purpose? To get into that graveyard on the other side where there was a demoniac of Gadara. Hallelujah, amen. <laughs> you say, how do you know that was his reason? Because when he went across the sea and got out, legion come and, and met him, don't torment us before our time. Jesus set him free. He put his own clothes on, by the way. I just thought I'd add that. He put his own clothes on and was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. What did Jesus do after that? Got right back in the ship and went back to the other side. You say, but Jesus come from the other side for one person? Oh yes, he would come from the other side for one sinner, one sinner. Hey, Zacchaeus was one sinner. Amen, the woman at the well was one sinner. Amen, Saul of Tarsus was one sinner. Oh, I don't wanna ever get over that. I don't want to ever get over that, that my help came from the other side. <laughs> Lord, I ought to preach on that. Hey, man. You know why the help came from the other side? There wasn't no help for us on our side because everybody you saw was in the same shape. Hey, we were all sinners. We were all condemned under God's holy law. But thank God 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came from the other side and came to where we were and paid our sin debt, become our substitute, and saved us by his good, marvelous, amazing grace. That right there will stir you up. In those times that people was brought to Jesus and I already gave you some examples and there's more. But when I think about the word come and I'm just gonna try to run through here and give you something. When I meditated upon that word come in the context of Jesus calling somebody to come to him, he said come unto me. He didn't say come toward me. He said come unto Jesus says, I can help you if I can get you close to me. That's right. Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. <laughs> the first thing I see that this word hints to is the word distance. Right. When Jesus said, come unto me, he was addressing people that was distant from him. That's right. yes, sir. Amen. Amen. So he's dealing with distance. I believe that, that the judgment seat of Christ will prove that distance has been probably as destructive as defilement has. A lot of church people might guard themselves against defilement because a lot of times that's external. But distance can be internal. I told our people yesterday about Judas Iscariot. When he was sitting there at the Lord's Last Supper, he already had the 30 pieces of silver in his possession. He had already made the deal to betray the Lord. All of that was internal. External, he was one of the 12. External, he was named as one of the disciples. But internally, he had allowed uh, he allowed that betrayal yes. to become so, it didn't start out big. That's right. It never does. Sin always starts out small, just like leprosy. Right. Yes, and it always starts out internally. Right. Amen. Right. Judah sat right there. And Jesus said, one of you is gonna betray me this night. And they started, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And went around the table and even Judas said, is it I? And the Lord said, thou sayest. Right, right. Now you can interpret that every how you want to interpret it. That was Jesus said, yes, you're it. You're the guilty one. Right. And Judas never made no effort to get right. 
I believe it's a dangerous thing for you to allow on the inside of you things. You're tolerating things. You're allowing attitudes to occupy inside of you. You're allowing bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. You're allowing thoughts in your mind that people can't see. And you're tolerating it and you're and maybe even excusing it. Blaming it on, well, after all, look how I'm hurt. Well, well, do least what? Are you a snowflake? Snowflakes in the house of God. That ought to be a message. That got to be a verse in there somewhere. The first thing he deals with with that word come is that we've got, okay, okay, before I can help you, I've got to get you where you can get some help. Right. You can't get help from a distance. Right. The far country never helped the prodigal and would have never helped the prodigal, never helped the prodigal. Right. He had to arise and when he come to himself, he arose and said, I'm going back to the Father's house. I'm going to position myself in closeness to the Father where I can get the help and the bread that I need. That's right. yes, sir. You know, probably one, number one enemy tonight of, of, of revival, I'm talking about a move of God. And I don't know much about Lexington and Winston-Salem and these areas. I preach down here some, but I'm telling you, I don't have to ask this. I know it's got to be true. Revival is desperately needed in this area. And it'll never hit the community till first it hits the church. Amen. 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 God does not work from the community toward the church. He works in the church toward the community. Amen. The first thing on this first night, who preached yesterday, preacher? You or? Raise your hand. Who preached? Right there. Those two. Okay, good. So, so first thing, I don't know what they preached. I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you know, you remember what they preached? Is that not distance? Which one's Benji right there? Distance. Defilement. Good way to know that you are not close to Christ is that there's corruption in you. There's sin in the camp. Amen. What would you preach, my friend? What about that? Martha was cumbered about with much serving and had an attitude with it. Lord, carest thou not? Lord, I, yeah, you, you're supposed to be tender and a compassionate Savior. Hey, my sister has left me alone to serve. Oh, yeah, she was, and by the way, Jesus was in her house. That was pretty close. But you can have Jesus in your house and still be distant. Oh, yeah, friend. Hey, first night, first night, right here tonight, we might as well not, there ain't no need playing games and, well, well, preach, I can't wait till Thursday night. Why wait till Thursday night? Why wait till Thursday night? Well, I don't know what you're going to preach the rest of the week. I don't know either. But I know one thing. I can't be preaching anything that's more important than what I'm preaching tonight. If we would all purpose in our heart that we're going to make an effort. I mean, we're going to make a conscious effort to get close to Jesus, amen, and deal with anything in the way, anything in the way. I don't care who I have to apologize to. I'm dealing with it. Oh, boy, boy, oh, boy, boy, oh, boy. Oh, yeah, friend. It don't matter what's in the way. I'm dealing with it. Yes, sir. Preacher, that five-week revival meeting at Mount Sinai followed up by a three-week meeting at Union, South Carolina, Brother Jarvis, my brother-in-law, Welcome Baptist Church. Followed up there at Scottville Baptist Church up in North Carolina, right outside of West Jefferson. 
And that one went four weeks. You know what was the key element in those? The key thing that started that out was conviction. People started not approving of their distance. They were not looking at their distance, amen, and saying, well, you know, I've got all kinds of excuses for that. There will be no excuses at the judgment seat. Well, you wait till I explain myself. Show me a Bible verse with that. When you stand before the all-knowing, omniscient God, amen, and you think for a second that he's, you're going to have something that you can say in an argument, no, you're going to be sending there probably like the rest of us, amen. Like, oh, Lord, help us. I sure wished I'd have took my Christianity spirit, the spirituality of my life uh, more serious. Amen. But not only was it conviction, conviction left, led to compliance. They weren't just that God dealt with people. They would go to the altar and deal with it. So you had conviction, then you had compliance. And then you had confession. Oh my goodness. I can still hear it. I can still see it. People confessing. You say, I'm gonna do that. Well, yeah, you won't be candidate for revival. Amen. And we need revival. There's going to be people go to hell if the church don't have revival. I got saved when revival hit at Middle Fork Baptist Church in right outside of Rosman, North Carolina back in 1981. I'd sat on those pews nine months before I was even born. Y'all didn't get that, did you? My, I was in mama's womb and mama... Mama going to church now. Hey, baby or not, mama's going to church. And I was a mama's boy. I don't care to tell you. Amen. And mama, listen, let me tell you something real quick. Mama was, she was a godly saint. Amen. And I got to telling about mama. She didn't actually lead me to the Lord but without her, I'd have never got saved. I ran away from home, rebellious, ran away from home because daddy said, you eat my food and sleep in my bed and wear my clothes and, 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 and the list goes on. You're going to church, son. You understand you're going to church or else. Well, I didn't need no explanation about the or else part. I'd been introduced to that many times. Yeah. And I ran away from home over that. Make a long story short, my mom come looking for me. I don't know still to this day how she found out where I was staying. She called me at work, Hendersonville, North Carolina, buyer sheet metal. I was a welder. Wasn't supposed to get a phone call unless it was emergency. Well, mama thought it was emergency. Her son's going to hell. The devil's dragging her son to hell, and that was an emergency. Amen. We'd probably see more children saved if parents would get more aggressive with their faith. No, most parents wants to be a pal to their children instead of a parent to the children. They want to be a friend. They want little sissy and junior to love mom and dad instead of respect them. And mama called me at work. Because I wasn't supposed to get a call unless it was emergency. So I went to, the, they come and got me, and I went to the thinking, well, what's going on? This has got to be serious. So what, whoever this is, because I'm not supposed to get a call at work. I, I, I got to the phone, I said, hello? And all I heard was <laughs> sobbing and weeping. I never had to say, who is this? I knew exactly who that was, because that mama had whipped wept over me before numerous times and prayed over me numerous times when she got her composure. I'm 20 years old now. I got my own bank account, my own truck, my own, my own everything. Amen. That didn't make no difference to mama. 
18 years old don't mean diddly squat to a mama. Are y'all listening? You kids think that when you turn 18, that makes you the boss at your house and the boss of your own life? Oh, no. It still applies to you to obey your parents. For this is right. Amen. It don't matter if you're 18, 19, 29, 39. Amen. Or, or the on up. It's exactly right. And she said, son, I done found out where you were staying. I've done went and got all of your stuff. Never asked me. <laughs> Never asked me, not one time. Now, son, would it be all right if I go get all your... No. There's a time when mama thought it was time to intrude. And she, did, she went and got everything, loaded it up, and took it to the house. And then called me at work about it. Not for permission, just to tell me, now here's how it is, son. When you get off work, I didn't know they had revival plan, but she did. She said, when you get off work, son, you come on home. I was tired of eating Happy Meals. The toys were junk, I'm telling you. She said, what'd you do? I said, yes, ma'am. And I went home, and thank God I went home because I was on the broad road, wide open, headed, amen, for destruction, but my mom wasn't going to have it. I didn't tell you what she told me on the phone other than come home. She told me when she got her composure, she said, son, I didn't bring you through my womb into this world for you to die and go to hell. Woo! If I'd have been a saved saved boy, I'd have said, preach, mom. Come on, mom. Carry, Carry that mail. But I said, Mom, she said, I didn't bring you in this world if you die and go to hell. That's right. Thank God. I told that story at Mount Sinai. There was Mama standing up all over that building uh, that night and the nights following, standing up. Step out in the pew, Mama, step back. Amen. Stood up, step out in the pew and look at her pew of children and said, I'm going to be like his Mama. And those kids was like, <laughs> they, they wanted to get a t-shirt mama's a terrorist no I'm just kidding but hey talking about confessions and that people started confessing started confessing about being cold one young lady was over in the corner she was a praying and she stood she didn't even leave where she was at she just stood up And she addressed the whole church and her pastor. She said, and weeping, just squalling. And and, and does most of the lead, a lot of the lead singing in the choir specials. And sung specials herself. She she said, I need to apologize to my church because I've been cold. I've been cold in my heart. I'm in the pulpit, so I'm just directing traffic. That's all I did mostly. Amen. Holy Ghost gets to moving, the wind gets to blowing. You just have to direct traffic. Just, amen. Amen, that's right. And when, Listen, and when God moves, the more God moves, the more uncommon the services are going to become. In other words, you won't know from one minute to the next what's happening. God be moving. There'll be people in the back getting saved. Amen. We need a supernatural move of God. Amen. And so the confession started. Preacher, I didn't know this boy. I know him now. Austin. His brother, Ashton, had already been saved and surrendered to preach. Austin was on the back row. Teenage boy. He'd go out of the church service out in the parking lot and smoke dope. He was he was prison bound, jail bound, and worse, he was hell bound. But there was two, and I didn't know all this at the time, but afterwards I did. There were two men in the church that desperately needed to get right. Not necessarily with each other, but with their families. 
and they have four sections of pews. One of them stood up over here, and again, I don't know what's going on. All I know is that confessions is happening everywhere. People's getting right with each other. People's getting right with the pastor. People's getting right with the, with the church as a whole. And that, that one man stepped out into the aisle and he looked back at his family, his wife and, and children. And he said, I apologize. I want you to forgive me for not being the spiritual leader in the home that I needed to be and should be. Amen. I want you to forgive me. And son, mom was weeping, the kids was weeping. Of course, I just told them from the pulpit, I said, y'all just get all in there and love on each other. Amen. Boy, they did. They was in there loving on each other, mom and dad and the children and the parents. And as soon as that was going on and while that was going on, another man stood up over here and done the exact same thing, stepped out in the aisle, looked at his family and apologized likewise to his family, wife and family. That second one didn't even hardly get that done till Austin, the boy that was a nobody going nowhere, stood up in the back, on the back row and loudly said before the whole congregation and God and me and everybody, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I need to be saved. Son, that place, I heard people weeping all over that place because he, he attends there. And a lot, of his pe- a lot of his family attends, are members there. They started weeping in their pews. And so he's making it verbal and, and public, so I just addressed it from the pulpit. I, and I didn't even know his name at that point. I said, young man, you, you say you're not saved and you need to be saved. Yes, sir, preach, I need to be saved. I said, you believe if you come and ask God to save you, he'll do it? I sure do, preacher, I do. And Ashton was sitting over there, his brother, looked just like, sitting over there, saved and already called to preach. Down the aisle, Ashton come, or or Austin come. Son, that place went into orbit. Son, all them silver-haired saints had been praying for uh, Austin. They got it. They got beside theirself. They got beside theirself. Why? Because their answer to prayer walking down the aisle. Amen. Pastor went, Brother Rudy. He got up out of his seat and he come over and was, he was watching Austin run come down the aisle. He had a whole lot. Ashton, his brother, try, come your brother's coming down the aisle. Come and come and he's a pulling on him, trying to get him off. And, and Ashton just fell out in the floor, weeping. He was just he, his brothers coming down the aisle. All them prayers, all them prayers is being answered. And I mean, he just become, he just. And just was face down in the altar just weeping. So Brother Rudy just left him and went over there. And old Ashton got saved. I mean, Austin, I get them saying they they look like and they sound like. Ashton, Austin. So Ashton, or Austin stands up in a few minutes and Brother Rudy asks him, so what happened to you? He said, I got saved. And then somebody else close by said, I got saved too. And Brother Rudy got to look and said, who said that? And there was a young man sitting in the back with him that heard all this going on and had slipped out and come down that side aisle and was in here in the altar listening when Brother Rudy was telling Austin how to be saved. This other boy was hearing it. (laughs) And he said, I got saved too. Point made right there is, those people hadn't been confessing and getting right with God, which is synonymous of cutting close, dealing with anything between you and the Lord. There's nothing between my soul and the Savior. Well, if we'd do that tonight, if we'd just deal with the distance, no telling what the Lord would do this week. Revival broke out in the, in the in, I didn't tell you that, did I? They had revival scheduled in that Middle Fort Baptist church. I didn't know it, but guess what? I'm at home now. 
Got to go to church. I went on January 19th was the first night. Heard the preaching. And, and I don't know that the Lord dealt with me that night. But oh, January 20th, 1981, the Holy Ghost of God used to preach word to deal with me. I mean, oh my goodness. Life changing, amen. Down the altar I went. Nobody prayed with me because I was been raised in that church. Everybody in that church knew me. But I didn't need nobody to read no verses to me that night. Holy Ghost done him me up. Holy Spirit of God then took the preached word and the printed word and dealt with me, amen, and I got gloriously saved. If I, if I preach another night or two, you're gonna hear that again. Oh, I got gloriously saved, S-A-V-E-D, saved. So saved, I never went back to the dance floor. So saved, I never went back to Bud Stupid and Miller Low Life. So saved, amen, my life changed and still has changed. The girl that was sitting beside of me, that night I got saved, I was engaged to her and we were going to be married. But she didn't fall in love with a saved me. Well, she didn't, have, she didn't last long. I, I hit the ground running for Jesus. 13 days later, I surrendered to preach. February the 2nd, preach, surrendered to preach. Hey, man. And she bails out and disappears into the shadows. And I keep on going for God. 30 years later, I saw her. 30. You talking about time making a difference. <laughs> Billy Kelly sung that song, didn't he? Time will make a change. Oh, boy. I saw her in a place of business. I was preaching in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and I saw her. I like to not recognize her, really. Anyway, I asked her, I said, what happened to you that night I come by to get you to go to revival? I said, you just disappeared. She said, you changed too much. And I could put a grin plumb across my head, I'm telling you. I said, yeah, I'm still changed, and I'm still changing. Amen. Hallelujah. And I've not seen her since. Hey, man, boy, I'm glad I'm saved. Deal with the distance tonight. Deal with the distance. That word come. In fact, I may be done. I don't know. Let me just discern that a little bit. I mean, I got several more points. There's a detection involved. Come unto me. Come the call to closeness. He's dealing with people that knew the condition they were in because he addressed it. All you that labor and heavy laden, those of you that's burdened down, those of you that's weary with your life, those of you that's dissatisfied with what's going on in your life, he said, I'm talking to you. Come unto me. There's got to be a detection. My goodness, there's a lot of preaching there. That word come also identifies a desire. When Jesus said, come unto me, he's dealing with people. First, he's expressing his desire. When he said come, he's letting them know that's my will. That's what I want. Amen. His word is his will. That's what I want. Come unto me. That's what I want. I can help you if you'll listen, if you'll do what my word says. Amen. So what made it successful is if they had a desire. Do you have a desire? Do you have a desire to get close? I may need to word it like this. Do you have a desire to get back close? Is close the best word or is closer the best word? You can be satisfied with close, but it might be close enough. But if you'll live off of the closer principle, you'll always be looking ahead to higher ground Amen. and higher levels for God. Amen. Desire. Amen. Amen. Then there's a demand. When he said come, that was a demand. That was an imperative mood, expressing a command to be carried out based on the authority of the one commanded it. You getting close as a believer, you getting close to Jesus, that's not a suggestion, that's it's a right. command. Amen. Then it involves a decision, that makes sense. Come unto me, he's waiting on the response. There's gotta be a decision. You ought to make that decision tonight. I'm gonna make the decision to follow Christ and get close. I wanna get close, I wanna get close. We're in a day that encourages distance. 
We're in a day where everything going on in our world, you can't listen to the news. I, we had our TV cut off I don't know how long ago. I couldn't stand it. I mean, you talking about just depressed. I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night mad and not even know what about. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Distance is not caused by a virus, I can tell you that. Right. And then it involves a departure. When Jesus said come, he means leave from where you're at. Right. Leave from where you're at and come to me. Depart from where you are. And that, that's the point right there that most people closes the door. Right. Oh, no, no. Right. If I could get right and not have to change, that's if I could good. get right and not have yes, to move, then I'd be fine. But there's a, 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 in fact, this same word come, just give me just a few more minutes, please, 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 please. I drove a long ways. The word come, the same exact word come that is used in Matthew 11, 28 is used in John, John 11 about the tomb of Lazarus. Amen. The exact, I was trying to look at the exact reference here about Lazarus, amen. The same word means to call or to leave or to depart. Amen. He left the grave, he left the grave closed, and he left the graveyard. Amen. That's right. It involves a departure. What are you willing to leave from tonight? Or what are you willing to not leave? Then it involves a direction. This is simple. This is so simple. I know you, you're tired already. Listen. When he said, come, let me, preacher, let me, can, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you're going to pass the test or I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't embarrass you. I wouldn't embarrass you. I just want you to uh, just stand right over there. Or just stand up right where you're at. It's fine. Just stand right, right there. And you just listen. Because come is a command, right? All right. You don't have to do it. But what I want you to do, what I want you to do is I want you to point in the direction that, that you're supposed to go. Pastor, come. Just point. And that wow. He got a he got an A already. <laughs> Do you see that? Go toward the voice. Yeah. Go toward the word. Yeah. We're, we're, we, we, preacher, we need to get right, but we don't really know what. Go toward the word. Jesus said, Come. That means I'm the, I'm the destiny. You come unto me. That word unto means point reached. Come to me. If you come toward me and stop before you get to me, you didn't come far enough. Amen. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. There's, a, there's a direction involved in that word come. Go toward the voice. Did you, let me give you an example. Did you know Adam and Eve did not have fellowship with the visible presence of, Christ, of God? Some of y'all look like you just heard something fresh. Ain't that something? Adam said he heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. The voice of the Lord. He had fellowship with God's word. Not his visible presence, but his voice. Amen. Right here is the word. The recorded voice of God. There's a direction involved. Amen. There's a destiny involved. Listen, the destiny is Christ, not the preacher, not, not someone else, not friends. Come unto me, point reached, go to Jesus, amen. Oh, and guess what? I know y'all waited for this. I, I, y'all see me close it right there? I know that don't mean nothing. I want to finish the word. It ends up with dividends. Really, where do you get that at? Oh, let me quote it, and I'll quote it slow. Come unto me, all ye that labor nor heavy laden. Oh, here it comes, here it comes. And I will give you. What? So Jesus is wanting me close to him, not for what I can give him. He's wanting me close to him so what, for what he wants to give me. And in this text, what he wants to give me is what I need. I'm weary. I, amen. I'm heavy laden. I'm burdened down. I need rest. 
best. I need that. The Lord said, what I'm going to give you is going to match what you need. Thank God for the dividends. I will give you amen. Boy, I love it. I love it. Distance will take it, but closeness will give it. Distance is what the world can give you, but closeness is what Jesus can give you. Distance, distance will hurt you. Closeness will help you. Distance is carnal, but closeness is spiritual. Distance is all about you and what you want, but closeness is all about Jesus and what he wants for you. Amen. And the list could go on and on. Amen. Come to call to closeness. Yes, sir. Let's all stand our feet. Father, we come in Jesus' name. I want to thank you, Lord, tonight for the good liberty to preach, good leadership to preach, Lord. God, I don't know of anything, Lord. I don't know of anything that would influence every area of our life spiritually for you more than closeness to Christ. And Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, it, we know that it's serious on your heart. We know, Lord, it's big in you. You're the one that took the initiative to make the statement, come unto me. But Lord, I pray you'll help us here tonight. Every man, every woman, mother, father, son, daughter, every young person, Lord, everybody. Lord, would make, a, make an effort tonight, make a decision tonight. I'm gonna get close to Jesus. God can't use me at a distance. God can't use me from a distance. Lord, help us tonight. Lord, there's no telling what potential is in some of these young ladies. There's no telling what potential is in some of these young men tonight. Lord, there's people in this building tonight, Lord, that's lost some ground spiritually, and they know it. Those they live with may not know it, the pastor may not know it, but they know it. May they find themselves in an old-fashioned altar tonight in this invitation. Making it right tonight. So, Lord, you've convicted me. You've convicted me about my distance. You've convicted me that I'm not where I need to be. You've convicted me that I've allowed uh, uh, distance to come between me and you. And I want to work, I want to fix that tonight. And I'm making a conscious decision tonight that's going to be followed up with a conscious, continual effort of drawing nigh to you, Lord. The Bible said it is a good thing to draw near, to draw nigh to. Lord, we're, we're told in the epistle of James, you, Lord, to draw nigh to you and you'll draw nigh to us. I pray tonight, Lord, that you will help us to know, Lord, that closeness to Christ, Lord, is the most influential thing. Lord, it, it will enhance our, our worship. Lord, it will, it will, it will cause life Lord, to go to a whole other level. Yep. Lord, it, it's the difference of Egypt yes, and Canaan. Way, Lord. Lord, help the daddies and the mothers to lead the way. Lord, help the daughters and the sons, Lord, to realize my purpose in this life is to be close to Christ as a follower of Christ and my closeness will result in conformity. Yes, and I'll be conformed to the image yes. of God's dear son. Yes. Have your way tonight, I pray. Lord, there's no doubt in my mind, not because I preached it, but the truth, Lord, that was shared in the service tonight without a question, without a doubt, would bring revival to any person, would bring revival to any family, and would bring revival to any church. And it would bring revival through any church. Yes. If we would get more serious than ever before, of being close to you, Lord. Not looking for excuses. Yes. And we're all included. When you said, come unto me, all ye, that excluded no one. May we have that response tonight. And I'm going to get an altar myself, Lord. I really do. I want to get closer yes. and closer and closer. Lord, forgive us for ever having the close enough mentality. Most of the time when there's a close enough mentality that it is, it's really a distance that we're satisfied with. Have your way, Lord, in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, you come.